Um, I want to welcome Nicole, who is at, um, she's from OceanWise, and she is at the Vancouver Aquarium, and she's here with one of her colleagues. His name is Dave Rosen, and he is a marine biologist. So this, that's like one of the coolest job, astronaut, marine biologist, you know, they're up there and the really super cool jobs in the world. So we're here to learn about careers at an aquarium and um, what uh, you can do and uh, the learning that needs to happen for you to be working or volunteering at an aquarium. So we're going to help you guys with your sound and I'm going to turn it over to Nicole. Thank you very much. So welcome all of you. I'm Nicole from the Vancouver Aquarium as well as Oceanwise Conservation Association. So I'm really happy to share my knowledge and uh, my experience here at the traditional land of the Kalsanish people, including the Kul, uh, the Musqueam, Squamish, as well as Lewatif nations. So welcome all of you to the section today. And um, Oceanwise has been doing a great job in doing a scientific investigation for marine mammals as well as other uh, creatures that you can see in the ocean. So today I'm not going to talk a lot like I used to do, but I invite one of my friends here uh, to join us. Uh, his name is called David Rosen, and he is actually a marine biologist uh, along BC coast. So today we are going to ask him about a lot of questions on how to be a marine biologist. So, uh, Dave, hi. 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 Happy to be here. Yeah, so nice. Uh, so it's very nice to have you here with us today. And can you tell me a little bit about yourself and what uh, your work is about? Sure. Um, first, uh, for, I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about my background, and that's going to be uh, my first attempt at <coughs> sharing the screen because I haven't really used this before. So. We're, so you may have to uh, you may have to bear with me for a sec. Oh, this is much easier than I thought. Okay. So um, I'm a marine biologist, so I study things in the ocean. Can you guys see that? Okay. Okay. So uh, a lot of marine biologists I know grew up near the ocean, and they tell you stories about when they were young, they'd go down to the seashore, and they knew all the animals. I grew up in the middle of Canada. I grew up in Toronto. And so I really wasn't that familiar with the ocean, except for like TV programs and stuff. And even when I finished my high school, when I went to university, I went to the University of Guelph, which is near Toronto. And as you can see, it's also not on the ocean. We used to joke that it was, it was you know, the same distance to all of Canada's oceans. Um, but it had a very good marine biology program. So that's where I did my undergraduate work in marine biology. And then when I decided I wanted to specialize in that and specialize in marine mammals, I figured at that point, I'd better move somewhere where there actually were marine mammals. And so I did my graduate work uh, at Memorial University, which is in Newfoundland, which is about as far east as you can get and study um, marine mammals in Canada. And I lived there for almost a decade. And then I said, well, I've done the East Coast. Let's do the West Coast. And so I moved to the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, and um, have lived there for 20 odd years studying marine mammals. And that's kind of my personal journal journey of literally my journey of how I became a marine biologist. Oh, that's so cool. So can you tell us about your work here in BC? Because uh, we're curious about marine biologist works here. Sure. Well, as I mentioned, I, um, I study marine mammals and I guess maybe we should have a little bit primer of what marine mammals are. So you can, as a marine biologist, you can study fish, you can study plankton. Um, I kind of went for the big guys. I went for marine mammals, whoops. We've seen that. And marine mammals are basically, everyone I think here knows what a mammal is. Um, so marine mammals are animals that live, mammals that live part of the time in the ocean. Now they don't spend all their life in the ocean. Some of them don't, like whales do, but seals and sea lions don't, but they rely on the ocean. But some of them like seals also rely on land. And 
there's all different types of marine mammals. It's kind of like a weird group of animals in that they're not related to each other, but they all do the same thing. So we have what scientists call the pinnipeds, uh, which means in Latin, it means fin-footed. And these include the seals, the sea lions and fur seals, and the walrus. And then we have the cetaceans, or what most people know as the whales. And we have the toothed whales and the baleen whales. And some people also think, well, aren't dolphins a separate group? Dolphins are just the smallest type of toothed whales. And then other marine mammals that we have include polar bears. They rely on the ocean and seals to make them living. Manatees and dugongs, which are usually tropical in nature, although there was um, a manatee that lived in northern Alaska until we hunted it to extinction. And of course, a lot of people's favorite and most cute marine mammal, the sea otter. And um, why I study marine mammals, um, because they're kind of cool. We have to remember that marine mammals started off as land mammals and they evolved to go back into the sea. And the sea is a very harsh place for you to survive. We couldn't survive being a marine mammal. So one of the reasons I study marine mammal is they're kind of cool in how they survive. They, um, they have to stay warm in very cold places. This is a picture of some Weddell seals that live under the ice in the Antarctic. That's where they, they forage and they swim. That's a very cold place. Um, they're very fast. So the fastest marine mammal is probably the common dolphin. It can uh, get up to speeds of 64 kilometers an hour. You've seen videos probably of them keeping up with boats. Um, and it, you know how hard it is to swim in the ocean um, because there's a lot of drag and they're perfectly adapted for this. Um, they dive really, really deep. The biggest, uh, the deepest dive that we've recorded as scientists is from this really strange looking whale called Cuvier's beaked whale. We don't know a lot about beaked whales because they're usually really, really deep in the ocean, except when they're coming to the surface. And scientists put a tag on this and they recorded it diving down to almost three kilometers. That's deeper than submarines go. And they stay down in the water for a very long time. So sperm whales, they probably hold the record for the most routine long dive. So they routinely dive very deep for an hour and a half at a time. Um, the other reason I, whoops, sorry. The other reason I study marine mammals is because they're in trouble. So um, a lot of the work we do at the Vancouver Aquarium or most of the work we do is based on conserving species. And we got a lot of species, even just, you know, the, in large animals that we know are in trouble. So we have the, the North Pacific right whale, which lives off of New England and Nova Scotia, and they're down to about 300 animals. The Southern resident killer whales that we have in British Columbia, they're down to about 73 animals. Probably the most concerning thing that's going on with marine mammals is actually the smallest dolphin, the smallest porpoise in the world, the vaquita, which lives in Mexico, and there's less than two dozen animals. Um, they're being caught in fishing nets that are actually not designed to catch them. They're catching another fish illegally, but these, these poor vaquitas get caught in the net and drowned. And it's, it's very likely um, that this species will go extinct in our lifetime. And there's been other species like the Chinese river dolphin, which has gone extinct in our lifetime. And we have a responsibility as humans to try to um, help these species because the sad truth is, is usually the reason they're in trouble is because of things we're doing. Uh, I'm trying to, oh, stop sharing. There we go. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, for sure. Okay. That's so cool. 
So do you have anything to add before I jump to the other questions? <laughs> Well, well I, I didn't know if you, so a lot of the work I do, I mean, it's great to be able to study animals in the wild. Um, most of the animals that I study, my laboratory is really within the Vancouver Aquarium. I'm really lucky that we have animals there that we can use for research and do studies on, and all the studies are designed to help animals in the wild. Mm. We can watch some video now, or we can watch some video later when people get sort of bored of asking questions. <laughs> I can show you all the fun things we do with animals, which is really the best part of the job. Maybe we can Maybe show we can some videos some too. Questions. Oh, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you want, Dave? Do you want to answer some questions now from the students? Sure. Why don't we? Why don't we do that? And then when we we talk too much, I'll show you some videos. To alleviate, you know, me talking. Okay. okay, so Gibbler, who is in almost every session, like I would say 99% of our Connected North at Home sessions, wants to know how old you have to be to volunteer at the aquarium. Um, I'm not, maybe Nicole knows, I think you have to be 14, but I'm not positive. Um, there yeah, is a um, board here services that you can call. Yeah, uh, for Vancouver Aquarium, it would be nice if we have age at least 14, but actually for the whole um, city or even the whole country, we have a lot of citizen science program as well. So we recommend all of you really look to some citizen science program in uh, Canada, especially for one that is called Ochre Sounds, that you can uh, actually listen to sounds of ochre and try to uh, identify those sounds for the scientists to facilitate the uh, citizens, uh, the, the investigation as well. So yeah, for Vancouver Korean, we have an age limit, but yeah, we do have other kind of programs that you can get involved to. Yeah, so and OceanWise has a list on their website that we'll have on our resource page soon of some citizen science projects that you can join and Taking It Global does as well. Um, I guess the big question from here for many, many people, Ivory and Raphael and Riley want to know, Dave, how can we help when we know that there's only so few of pop in populations that uh, that are still around, like, how can we help as citizens? Right. Well, you know, the, the best thing a citizen can do when it comes to helping the planet in any degree is learning about the issues. Um, most of you are too young to vote, but you can really influence your parents to vote for people who are going to make change. You know, politicians like to get elected, and people elect them. And so if you say, we want you to, to make these changes as a government, we really need to be making large scale changes that, I mean, it's great that individual people can help and do their little bit, things like shoreline cleanup and reusing um, and uh, cutting down on the amount of plastics we throw out and pollution like that. But the, the big changes are gonna come by forcing governments to make big changes. Um, and that's, some, that's something where the, the population can really do, but you have to know what you want and you have to understand the science behind it. Okay, and Leah has a question. What can we do about the captured dolphins that are still in captivity in for-profit aquariums? Well, that's a very, um, it's a very complex issue that um, a lot of people are very passionate about. And as an animal lover, I understand their passion. Um, and the, the simple answer, I'm afraid, is it, there isn't a simple answer. You know, these are animals that have spent their life in facilities. Um, you know, it is as a scientist and as an animal welfare person, I would be very uncomfortable with suggestions of, of just releasing to them the wild. It's not an environment they're used to. Um, but I think what you need to ensure is that the facilities that are keeping these animals are doing the very best for them. So for example, at the Vancouver Aquarium, everything in the animals' days is structured around the welfare or the well-being of those animals. And the well-being of animals that have spent a lot of time or even their entire life in a facility are very different than wild animals. 
Um, we're really seeing it now. It's interesting in zoos and aquariums around the world, because we don't have the public coming in, because almost all the zoos and aquariums, certainly in North America and in Europe, are closed. We're actually finding that the animals are missing the public and they're missing the routine. This is part of what makes their lives interesting is interacting. So, you know, for example, there's, I was reading about these giraffes that at a certain time every day, they meet the public. The giraffes are still coming over to meet the public at that time, but there's nobody there. So the trainers, you know, the people who are trainers and work at these institutions, they love animals too. And they're really doing their best to make sure their lives are uh, the best that they can be. That's a great answer. Um, Erica wants to know what is the most endangered sea um, mammal right now? The most endangered sea mammal is the vaquita um, that we know about. Um, but it's hard to get much more endangered than that. There's been, in the last few years, there's been a tremendous scientific effort on trying to rescue the vaquita. And that's everything from going out there and stopping the illegal fishing that the nets that these animals are getting caught at. There's even be, been attempts by the international community to try to catch some vaquitas and bring them temporarily into a holding facility in the area to sort of safeguard them until their environment is made safe again. Um, unfortunately, that didn't work even with the best human experts. Um, so that's the type of thing. The whole issue with vaquitas is it's actually being fueled by a desire for the fish bladder of a fish for traditional Asian medicine. And it's actually illegal to count all the fishing for this fish is illegal. And they put out these nets and the vaquita get caught in them as well and they drown. So it's, it's the fish itself is endangered and then it's impacting another endangered species. And it's completely under human control. That is, that is something that uh, we have complete control over and we could stop very quickly if there was the political will to do that. Wow. Wow. Well, so, yeah, that's a amazing answer to a very difficult question. So let's, let's look at some videos and then we'll come back. Okay. So we have so many questions and we're going to have to lead the students to the OceanWise site to get some of them answered. Sure. So um, over to you, Dave, for some uh, additional info. Okay. So this is this is we we've we've talked a little bit about some not very happy topics. So this would be a good time to uh, <laughs> show you show you some of the, the things. So so as I say, most of my research is actually at the Vancouver Aquarium. Um, we there is a, a very strong philosophy at the Vancouver Aquarium and the OceanWise organization for supporting research to help save our oceans. And that includes research with the marine mammals that we have temporarily or permanently in our care. Um, so usually people ask me as a marine biologist, what's the best part of my job? Um, without a doubt, it's working uh, closely with the individual animals. Uh, that's why I got into it. Uh, that's the best part of my job. These are all pictures when it's sunny in Vancouver, we get a lot of rain, but even if it's a rainstorm, it's still the best part of my day. Um, so here's just some fun video of two of the animals that we work with, stellar sea lions, which are actually the largest sea lion in northern fur seals, which are much smaller. And this is just some fun videos that some of the, the staff took. I'm going to start. frozen. I seem to have frozen on everything. <laughs> I can't forget. Oh my gosh. Cool. Try on sharing your screen and then reshare it. That might help. I actually I actually can't even unshare my screen. <laughs> my mouse has just completely disappeared. Yeah, Ooh. that happened to somebody yesterday and they just um X'd out of the program. And, okay. and then rejoined? Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait. Uh, my mouse sort of. Yes, technical difficulties. Yeah, and sometimes 
because so many people are working from home right now, guys, it's taking a big drain on the internet. So it, that's what's happening. Yeah, technology these days. Well, thank goodness we have it. Um, so maybe Nicole, you can talk a little bit about the work that you do at um, OceanWise while the students yeah. are waiting. Yeah, for sure. So for scientists like Dave, they are constantly doing a lot of work about marine mammals. They try to rescue them. They try to learn about a behavior. And that's something that is not very accessible for a public. So that's why we have educators here like me. And we offer a lot of online programs. We offer a lot of curriculum programs, visiting programs, so that students can come over to a aquarium on site or even online and try to learn more about the marine mammals as well as other kind of animals that we see in the ocean. So what my job is, is that I try to convert so uh, a lot of complex issues into some easy ones so that public as well as students can actually try to learn about the scientific investigation that scientists are doing and in order to let all public to support our work. So what I do every day <clears throat> is that I try to come uh, in the Vancouver Aquarium at 7.30 and I host three to four programs a day and try to talk to people like you all and try to tell you about what I know and what the Vancouver Aquarium is doing currently. So um, I really enjoy my job here because I happen to talk to a lot of people. I try to learn stuff while I was working. And even though uh, now the aquarium closed, but we also receive a lot of questions from the audience like you guys as well as from um we lost your sound nicole hello yeah we can hear you now so um yeah so if you have any questions really type it uh or email us so basically our work besides meeting friends uh, meeting our um uh our visitors here our students here we also type uh, we also try to answer as many questions as we can and try to make a lot of teacher resources to teacher and educator as well as parents so that they can try to convey those knowledge from the Vancouver Aquarium to their kids, to their students, as well as their friends. So this is basically my work here. Yeah. And you do a great job. So maybe um, one of the students before asked about the, st the sea lions who were just brought to the um, aquarium. She wanted to know how they were doing. Oh, they're actually doing really, really good. So for now, um, I, I uh, initially, I want to show you the the big hab uh, habitat here, but actually for the sea lions, they're actually uh, being at the backstage because our dedicated team here, they try to take care of the sea lions every day. So um, <clears throat> from time to time, they will be uh, transferred to another uh, habitat in order to have a closer observation so that uh, for the scientists, they can actually observe uh, the behavior of the sea lions to check their health condition. Um, so now, now for a lot of animals, they are in good hand and um, they are actually having a good time here because they continue to have a lot of food here. Uh, our our teams are having a very uh, are paying a lot of attention to those animals and they are here every day in order to take care of the sea lions here, the penguins, the seals, as well as um, fish here, the frogs here, uh, as well as the jellies here. So everyone is paying attention and try their very, very best in order to protect those animals here in the Vancouver Aquarium. Okay, and Katie, I hear the host now, so I see that Dave is back. If you could please give him um, privileges. Uh, Celine would like to know how many more years would there be more plastic than fish? So for some research, um, there are 
uh, report saying that if we do uh, continue to produce or use single use plastics after 50 years or so, there will be more plastics than the organisms in our ocean. So is our mission and also is our action in order to protect the ocean, but try to reduce your use of plastics. So yeah, we do have a lot of sections about plastics, so stay tuned. <laughs> okay, so Dave's back, so we'll turn it over to Dave. Uh, right. I'm. Should I risk once more trying to share my videos with people? I mean, there was interest in seeing the animals. Sure, let's try it. Uh, if, if not, <laughs> we'll we'll try it once more. Um, actually, it's not. Hmm. I don't think I have privileges to share my content. Oh. Maybe Katie, can you help with that? <laughs> you do now. Maybe try opening the video on your computer first, now Dave. Go. Now I got it. Yeah, open the video first, then share. Yeah. Okay, so can you guys see the, the video in the center? Yep. Okay. So these are. I'll just keep it small because we're having bandwidth problems. These are some of the fur seals and sea lions that we have at the Vancouver Aquarium. Um, people were asking if they could see them. We can't see them live right now, but this is sort of what happens with the, everyone in red is a professional trainer. This is a stellar sea lion. She weighs about 250 kilograms. They're actually the largest sea lion. And these little ones are Northern fur seals. They're actually fully grown as well. Um, so every day, they get uh, trained, they get fed, they get health checks, um, and then they do some science, which is sort of how they, they make their living. Um, but it's all fun for them. Everything is done with the animals, what we call positive reinforcement. So they only get rewarded for doing things. They never get punished, right? They get multiple chances to do things. In addition to actually physically in the aquarium, we have another facility outside of the aquarium in a suburb where we have sea lions who they live in a facility and then they swim and dive freely in the open ocean. Um, and this is so we can study what seals and sea lions do best, which is swimming and diving. We really don't have you know giant tanks at the aquarium we can study. Here we can dive in their natural environment. They can feed on fish. We can set up artificial fish fields and we can study them in ways that we never could either in the wild or within the aquarium itself. Now, some of the other animals we have, we for a while we had walruses visiting us for about a year and a half. These were very young walruses that were born in Quebec. And it's very rare to have well-trained young walruses. And so as a scientist, what we wanted to know is how much food they need to grow and how their body grows. So this is a couple of the training staff taking measurements along the, the animal at different lengths to see, are they getting fatter? Are they getting longer? How can we measure the health of animals in the wild? Um, and this lets us know how much food or other prey they might need in the wild. Um, another thing we wanted to know is how much energy it takes to be a walrus. And one of the things that walruses need to do is swim and dive. And so we actually trained our walruses for these really special experiments where they're trained to swim around a pool or hold still under, we'll see this, a very sort of not very fancy piece of equipment. This is called a respirometry dome. If you can see this floating dome, it looks like a window. And this is basically, we measure how much oxygen the animals are using doing different things. So they come up into this dome and they breathe um, and we get them to swim courses underwater. And this lets scientists know how much fish the animals need to do different behaviors. So in the case of walruses, if they have to swim further in the wild because the sea ice is melting, how much fish do they have to catch? And I heard somebody say that their favorite was the sea otters. And I guess really we have to show we do do research with the sea otters. Again, you know, they're famous for how much food they, they need to eat, but we really don't know what kind of food they need to eat. So we've been doing a lot of studies 
looking at sort of their diet and what food is good for them and why the food available in the wild might be um, limiting how their populations are growing. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing now. There we go. Oh, that is so cool, Dave. So I have a question for you. So um, I know there's a lot of students passionate about the ocean as well as the marine, uh, marine mammals around. So how can they actually um, be a marine litter? How can they do in order to be a marine litter, a marine biologist like you? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, um, it's a long road to become a professional everything. Um, and marine biology is no different. Um, you know, a lot of people describe themselves as a marine biologist, but you, you can't study everything in the oceans. Um, and so I study a particular thing. I study seals and dolphins and whales and, and dugongs. And it takes a lot of education um, to become a sort of a professional marine biologist. I had to do um, an undergraduate degree in science. And then I did two graduate degrees. I did a master's degree and a, and a doctorate degree. Um, and then I got a job in research. Um, some people are lucky that they don't have to get all those degrees and they can, you know, there's different levels of being a scientist they can do. Um, and the education is quite diverse. You know, people say, well, obviously all you have to do is take sciences. And there's a lot of other skills to becoming a, a scientist. Um, writing is really, really important. I spend a lot of my time reading scientific papers and writing scientific papers because it's one thing to go and do science and do really good science, but it can't just sit there on your computer. And so you have to publish scientific articles and that is telling your colleagues and the world what you're doing and what you found, how you're advancing knowledge. If if you're not good at writing, then nobody's gonna read it and the, all the neat things you discovered are never gonna be um, never gonna be recognized and you're not really gonna help things. And the other skill that you need, and I usually hear groans when I say this, in addition to sciences, is maths are because a lot of science involves maths ultimately when you collect the data and then you look at the data. And so there's, there's, there's a lot of much more math than I ever imagined. Uh, math was not my strength. And that's the important thing to remember. You find something you have a passion for and there's gonna be road bumps along the way. Um, you know, there were some, some things I was good at I was good at writing. I was pretty good at science. I was not good at math. Um, it's something I had to to fight with, um, but it it was a necessary thing for me to do. And and that's what that's what any career is 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 finding the things you're passionate about and then overcoming the hurdles that are going to come in the way. Oh, yeah. This is also the advice for me as well. I was trying to do my um, biology degree and then try to do more like. Uh, persuading a higher education and now, yeah, that is uh, actually a very good advice from Dave in order to get everyone's moving and motivated. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dave. The, the other thing about being a marine biologist or working with the oceans or working in the environment is when I was um, studying, there weren't a lot of options for becoming a marine biologist. Becoming a marine biologist you went, you did your graduate degree, and then you got a professional position at a university usually, or something, sometimes a government. Now there's a lot more options for people who are interested in a career in anything to do with the environment. There are private companies, there are uh, what we call non-government organizations, things like you know, Greenpeace or um, even OceanWise that need scientists to work for them. So it's there's a lot more options to find a career that fits how you want to work. 
That's a very good advice. Yeah, so everyone, you can try to do more by do, really learning about the ocean and then try to figure out what's your uh, thing that you are passionate about and try to pursue your dream as much as you can. And that will be one of the career that you can consider as well. Yeah, so Melly, do you want to take some questions for the session? do about five minutes of, of more questions. Um, and I like the the the, uh, the comments about the no plastic and Nicole's always been sharing her really cool straw. But this is my oops. This is the cool straw that I carry in my purse. It's uh, it's in a little bamboo case and then it folds up and it's a portable um, a little straw that comes with a cleaner. So that's one thing that we can do to help by reducing single use plastics. So think of what you do in your house. This is just the one thing that I do that's really simple. And because I am over 18, I do get to vote and I do vote for our environment. Um, so they, they, Barb says you're great at explaining things. Uh, let's have some questions for Dave. Someone was asking about uh, the dolphin that was at the Vancouver Aquarium. What happened to the dolphin that was there? Uh, Anya needs to know where the dolphin is. <laughs> so right now for uh, our dolphins, they are actually taken care of by our team here. We have trainers as well as our biologists here. Um, she is actually in our exhibit now, but is at the other side of our dear aquarium. So we're not able to show you right now, but she is doing great. <laughs> and Stephanie would like to know which college or university did you go to? Maybe, maybe both Dave and uh, Nicole. Sure. Well, I did my undergraduate at the University of Guelph, which is near Toronto uh, in Ontario. And I did an undergraduate uh, degree in marine biology, and then went to uh, Memorial University of Newfoundland, which is in St. John's, which was a surprise to me because I didn't actually know there was a university in Newfoundland. I figured it was in Halifax. I went to work with a particular person, and uh, I studied uh, animal behavior. I studied the behavior of marine mammals. I was in the field studying harbor seal mothers and pups trying to understand that early relationship. And then I stayed there and did my doctorate or my PhD uh, looking at marine mammal physiology. Um, and then I came to the University of British Columbia um, for my first job. And Alex, that's a great career path and school path. Alexis and Ben would like to know if you have a favorite marine mammal and what is it? Uh, Nicole, do you want to go first? Yeah, my favorite animal is will definitely be sea otter. It's the first marine mammal that I saw in Vancouver because I'm from Hong Kong. So I was fascinated by those sea otters, so how cute they are and how try how to eat their little sea urchin and then also crabs uh, on their tummy and it's so cute. So this is one of the coolest thing, coolest animal that I've met. Um, How about my, you, Dave? Yeah, my favorite marine mammal has to be the harbor seal, the poor, underappreciated harbor seal. Harbor seals are, they don't get the limelight. They're like the mutts of the marine mammal world, but they're they're really nice animals. They're really interesting. Um, and, um, you know, that's one of the first animals I worked really closely with. And so they always have a, a near and dear place in my heart. And the pups, the pups are fantastic because the, the, the pups will just um, tear your heart out because when they're calling for their mothers, they actually sound like they're calling for the mothers. And I'll try to do a really bad imitation. When a harbor seal pup is calling, it goes, ma, ma, ma. It, it's like, it literally sounds like it's calling for its mother. Why doesn't everyone say that in the chat? Ma, ma, ma. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like that. Um, do you still have the sea lion that's blind at the Vancouver Aquarium and how is he or she? Um, I'm not sure about that, Dave. Do you have? I think, yeah. they, I think they're talking about Senko, Senior Senko. So Senior Senko was a California sea lion that was found on a beach in California. 
and we think he was uh, in, um, sorry, English Bay, uh, on Spanish banks, actually, if anyone's familiar with Vancouver. And um, he was called Senior Sanko because it was also Sanko de Mayo Day that he was found. And um, he had been shot in the face, unfortunately. And so uh, he was blinded. And so they, um, the vet staff here, the amazing vet staff here at Marine Mammal Rescue um, got him healthy again. Um, the trainers trained him to um, sort of navigate around his environment when he was brought to the Vancouver Aquarium. He's incredibly agile animal. He learns his new tank space and the animals that are with him very, very quickly. He's very comfortable. He's very gentle. Um, and um, California sea lions, everyone thinks all sea lions do that barking sound. Bar, ar, ar, ar. And that is only California sea lions, only male California sea lions mainly. And for years, we never had to put up with that. But now every morning, if you walk by the Vancouver Aquarium, you will hear Senior Senko uh, barking. And he's doing very well. Unfortunately, because of his condition, he can't be released back into the water. Dave, I popped an article in there that was from Global News about him, and there's a little video from the veterinarian that treated him. So if anyone wants to check it out, I popped it in the chat. That's so quick, Katie. We'll put that on the resource page, too. Um, Ashley would like to know, how many marine mammals are there? Uh, in the world? Yeah. How many species? How many species? There are... Depends how you divide it up, but there are about 60, almost 70 species of marine mammals. Awesome. That's great. And it's so um, wonderful to hear the passion. Okay, we can stop calling for our maws now. Okay, we'll, we'll do two last questions or maybe two last messages from Nicole and uh, Dave. Maybe if there's one thing. So just for, uh, one piece of information. Um, I know this is sort of careers in, in marine biology, but I know probably a lot of people were looking at the training staff and going, ooh, that looks like a fun job. And it is a fun job. It's a very difficult job and they're not paid very well, uh, but they're very passionate about working with animals. And there's all sorts of ways that people can become trainers or husbandry staff, take care of marine mammals or fish within zoos and aquariums. And so that's something if you don't, if you can't think of going to school for the next, you know, how many years, and that seems like something that you'd want to do, that's another career path you could look into. That's excellent. And Nicole, do you have one last thing to say to the students? Cause I know we're almost done. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, we have Dave here for us uh, as, a scientist, uh, as a scientist in order to let us to know more about uh, the, the marine mammals and also uh, their environment. And as my job, I try to convey messages from citizens, uh, the, from the scientists to citizens like you guys. And you have your own mission as well. So try to learn more about the ocean, try to do more sustainable actions that you do not do harm to the environment, try to do more eco actions. So uh, one way to learn more about the ocean is to go to our uh, ocean.org. Uh, uh, you can see a lot of videos, cool videos, as well as work that we have here at Korea. And of course, you can also try to learn more from the uh the sections afterwards and try to ask more questions on our online learning platform if you have so yeah we're looking forward to meeting you all again and thank you so much dave that was absolutely fascinating and nicole as always we love seeing your smiling face and know that you're so passionate about uh, keeping the animals healthy and happy and um Keeping us involved in that process. So thank you so much. And we'll have those resources hopefully on our website by the end of the weekend. And everyone says thank you. And someone said it was like being just like being at school. <laughs> I'm not sure that's positive. But thank you for it was a positive comment. It was yeah. definitely positive. <laughs> and thank you guys, you students, for coming as well. And if you go back to connectednorth.org um, at home, 
Uh, there's two more sessions today that one is with um, learning about fractions and the other is learning how to draw a woodland style um, turtle. So for us, those of us who love turtles, we have an, an artist who is from Vancouver, living in Vancouver and teaching us how to draw turtle woodland style. So, um, and we're glad you're coming back for fractions, Alexis and Ben. So we'll see you and see, see you too, uh, Jibbler and um, all of our friends, Declan coming back for everything, Sierra. Thank you so much. I, we're just, we have great kids. In our class, Katie and I. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.